Hello everyone. So, uh, so far we have discussed the radioactivity, the different types of radioactive decays, the nuclear structure, stability and the nuclear models, mainly liquid drop model and shell model. Today we will start the details of the nuclear decays like alpha, beta and gamma. In today's lecture I will discuss the alpha decay. Okay, so as we discussed in the introductory lecture, there are three types of decays, alpha, beta and gamma. There are others also like spontaneous fission and so on, but mainly we will be discussing the three types of decays like alpha, beta and gamma. So let us see the energetics, what are the types of energies that are involved when a heavy nucleus undergoes alpha decay. So, as you know already by the group displacement laws, during alpha decay, the atomic number of a heavy nucleus is decreased by 2, whereas the mass number is decreased by 4 because the alpha, alpha particle is coming out of the nucleus. Just an example, uranium-38 undergoing alpha decay to thorium-234. To calculate the energy of the alpha particle that is limited in alpha decay, we calculate the mass difference between the parent and the daughter products. So the mass of uranium-238 minus the sum of the masses of 234 and alpha and now if you write in terms of the atomic mass units, then you can multiply by 931 MeV or you can write in terms of the mass defect. So mass defect is nothing but delta M equal to M minus A where M is the actual mass in atomic mass units and A is the mass number. So this into C square becomes actually the mass defect and the mass tables actually give the masses in terms of mass defect. So what you see here is the 47.308 is the mass defect that means M minus A into C square. So when you have the alpha decay, since the mass number is conserved, essentially it will give you the difference in the masses of the parent and the daughter So 238 uranium, 238, and this is the mass, 234 thorium and alpha particle. So if you see the difference between this is equal to 4.27 MeV, that is the Q value of this alpha decay. Q value means the heat or the energy liberated in this process. So it's a positive Q value, this much energy is emitted. This energy is now shared between the alpha particle and the daughter product that is 234. So how it is shared, how to calculate the energy of alpha? The basic concept is that since the 238 uranium is stationary, when it is alpha particle emitted, then the momentum of this nucleus is zero. So when the, it's split into two particles, the net momentum should be again zero. And so the momentum, that is the linear momentum is mass into velocity. So M alpha, V alpha equal to M234, V234. That means the momenta of the alpha particle and thorium 34 are same. They will be in opposite direction, of course. So the net momentum will be zero. Now mv, if you can convert it to m alpha, m, m alpha e alpha, if you if you take a square of this one, like for example, mv, you take a square and 1 by 2, so it will become m 1 by 2 mv square. So essentially it becomes mass into energy. So you can convert this relationship between the momentum equal to relationship between the mass and energy. So M alpha E alpha equal to M234 E234 and you can see here E alpha upon E234 equal to M234 upon M. That is what I was telling that the Q value is shared between the two particles in the inverse ratio of their masses. That means E1 by E2 equal to M2 by M1. 
So you have two equations. Energy is equal to 4.27 MeV and the ratio. So you can now calculate energy of alpha equal to Q value into the ratio of the masses 234 by 238 that is 4.198 energy of 234 thorium the other part is 0.072 MeV. So you can see here the lighter particle takes the major share of energy because energy is shared in the inverse ratio of their masses. So lighter particle gives major portion of the energy and the heavier particle takes the smaller portion of the energy. So that is why you will see that sometimes you now we say Q value is close to alpha because the thorium to 34 is very very small energy. So alpha particles that are emitted now in this alpha decay have the energies of the order of 4 to 8 MeV. Second important property of these alpha particles is the alpha spectra. So when the two, when a heavy nucleus undergoes alpha decay and if you detect these alpha particles in the detectors, then what type of spectra we will see in the alpha spectrum. So here the even even nuclei that we are discussing like 234, 238 uranium and 234 thorium they have their ground state spins zero, zero because they are even even nuclei and so mostly the alpha decay between the two even even nuclei will go from ground state to ground state and so there will be only one alpha. So what you see here is that this is a typical alpha spectrum counts versus energy of alpha and you will get a single line in the alpha spectrum. Actually, you should have got a small, very thin line in one line because there is only one energy, but the detector has its own resolution, which you will discuss in the radiation detection measurements. And so because of that, there is a broadening in the alpha spectrum. There will be impact a left hand tail. So that uh, this happens because of the instrumentation aspect. When we have uh, in, in some many cases, you will find that the, apart from the ground state to ground state transitions, uh, there are also transitions to the excited states. Now, radium 224, the daughter product of thorium 228, had the excited states, they are called the rotational states 0, 2, 4, 6. I have just touched upon the collective model that the mid cell nuclei can also have their collective motions of rotation and vibration. And so, apart from the ground to ground transition, 72.7%, there can, can also be transitions to higher energy states. But they are hindered with respect to the ground to ground transitions. And in such cases where there are multiple alpha particles emitted, the alpha spectrum will be something like this. So, you have the main peak, this is the high energy peak, 72%. And then you have the lower energy, this energy. So if you say 1, 2, 3, so this will be 1, 2 and 3, energy is decreasing this way. So from this uh, data also you can make out that al how many alphas are being emitted in a particular radioactive decay. Now let us see how the half-lives of the heavy nuclei depend upon energy of the alpha particles. The typical values of alpha particle energy for heavy nuclei which are emitting alpha particles goes from 1.8 MeV which is 144 nylonium, one of the lightest nuclei to emit alpha particles and uh, almost the highest energy alpha particle is emitted is 11.7 MeV for 212 polonium which is a metastable state of polonium 212 and you can see here the, the corresponding half-lives. So if you have the alpha energy very low, then the half-life becomes very high, 10 to 15 years. And when we have the alpha energy very high, half-lives become very small. And we will discuss this part in more details when we will see the, the how to explain the decay, decay of alpha particle for heavy nuclei in terms of the penetration of a Coulomb barrier. So, the higher the energy of the alpha, lower is the half-life 
for the alpha decay. Just to see an example, see different examples here. All the even even nuclei of thorium, radium, radon, again radon to 20, polonium to 12, and you can see the alpha energy is increasing, whereas the half-life is decreasing from here to here. So as the alpha energy increases, the half-life decreases. And the normal range for the alpha decay, alpha energies is 4 to 8 MeV, though there are exceptions like 11.7 MeV or 1.8 MeV, but by and large in the mass region of 200 to 240, 50, you will see the alpha decay, alpha energies are of the order of 4 to 8 MeV. And the half lives accordingly go from microseconds to 10 to the power 15, 16 years or so. Now, you must be observing here that why there are no alpha emitters having masses below 134 or in fact there are none. So the question I would just put here, why is alpha decay not observed in low and medium A nuclei? This is a question which must be coming to the mind of the students. So the reason is that as you go down and down in terms of the mass number, the Q value becomes very small. If you recall the binding energy curve as a function of mass number B by A. So when we are here, heavy mass region, let us say the 150 may be somewhere here, then alpha decay is happening like this. A heavy nucleus is going to a lighter, slightly lighter nucleus and alpha particle emitted. So the binding energy is increasing. So when the binding energy is going down, when the going up means mass is coming down and so Q value will be positive. But if you see in this region, when, you, when, you, when there is the alpha decay, the binding energy is decreasing. So Q values are negative. So below mass number 150, you will find the Q values become negative or very low and the Coulomb barriers are high. So then you will find because of this region. Very low Q value or negative Q value and the very high Coulomb barrier that leads to the not no alpha decay between for the heavy nuclei, lighter nuclei masses more than 150. In fact, already around mass 150, the half lives are in the range of 10 to the power 15 or 16 years. In fact, a very interesting uh, correlations were obtained by Geiger and Nuttall, they called Geiger Nuttall law in 1911. At that time, did not have sophisticated detectors to detect the energies of alpha particles. Instead, they were measuring the range of alpha particles in different matters. And what they found, so the range actually is how much distance the alpha particle will travel in a material. So that was what they call the range. And this range is actually related to the energy of the alpha by let us say p e to the power q where e is the energy r is the range like alpha particle travel in few centimeters in air so what they found that the four different natural radioactivity series the ray, the lambda is increasing with the range that means as the range increases the decay constant increases or the half life decreases and this range can be correlated with the e alpha so as the energy of the alpha particle increases, the decay constant increases. That means the half-life goes down. So the same thing is shown here for different isotopes of heavy elements like polonium, thorium and fermium. The half-life and Q alpha are inversely correlated. As the Q alpha increases, the half-life goes down. Same correlation that you see from the bigger natal now. So the half-life of an alpha emitter will increase if the energy of the alpha particle decreases. That is the main this one. So lower alpha and Q alpha, higher now half-life. Okay. Now to alpha particles, why why it is problem that why this half-life, why the nuclei cannot emit immediately the alpha particles? So as you know, alpha particle is a charged particle and heavy nuclei, so the nucleus offers a potential, so they are all attract, in the attractive potential of the heavy nucleus, alpha particle is formed inside the nucleus. To come out of the nucleus, 
alpha particle has to cross a coulomb barrier so this is a typical example that you have the attractive potential well for the nucleons or if there is a preformed alpha particle the alpha particle is sitting inside the nucleus in a attractive potential well and now let us see the so suppose the energy of the alpha particle is this order it is coming out this energy but there, there is a coulomb barrier the coulomb barrier and alpha particle and alpha energy we discussed of the order of 4 to 8 mev and 4 to 38 uranium alpha decay we found it is 4.27 mev whereas the coulomb barrier now let us try to calculate the coulomb barrier the coulomb barrier so they, when they are like here no it, it is like the heavy nucleus and the small nucleus so when they are in contact it will say like z1 z2 so at contact the coulomb energy of this system can be calculated by z1 z2 e square by r1 plus r2 and so you can calculate this by this formula 1.4382 this is a term depends upon the this is a pre pre term for this formula z1 um, in a charge atomic number of alpha particle z2 atomic number of thorium and into so this is r0 a1 one third plus a2 one third now why this 1.4382 has come this comes in terms of mev so what i try to see here that if you see e square so only terms here are the in the charge of the electron square upon the radius in centimeter e square by centimeter so esu square electrostatic upon centimeter and one let one esu so it will become 4.8 10 to the power minus 10 square upon centimeter it will become arcs so this is what i have done here that if you put this value it will come in arcs and now you can put this in terms of this you can write 10 to the power minus actually this is 13 centimeter this is like the radius of a nucleus and then you convert into arcs into joule so 10 to the power minus 7 joule per arcs multiplied by that and joule to mv it will be 1.602 10 to the power minus 13 joule per mv 1 mv 1.602 10 to the power minus 13 joules so like that if you do this uh, put the different units and their factors uh, whole thing will come to 1.438 so instead of no every time putting these numbers you straight away put 1.4 or you can even make 1.44 into char atomic numbers of the alpha and the thorium upon 1.4 this is r0 and a1 one-third a2 one-third so this can be this will come out to be 23.2 mev so you can see here a alpha particle of energy 4.27 mev you have to come out of a coulomb barrier which is in the potential well where the coulomb barrier is 23.2 mv so classically it's not possible for a 4.27 mv alpha particle to escape from a potential well of 23.2 mv but quantum mechanically yes alpha particle can penetrate this coulomb barrier and come out with a finite probability that is what is the problem of barrier penetration so by quantum mechanical tunneling one can in fact calculate the decay constant for the alpha decay of heavy nuclei so the decay constant for the alpha decay lambda is equal to the penetration probability for alpha decay into the frequency of the alpha particle so you see the alpha particle is formed here alpha particle is formed and it is striking the coulomb barrier so there is a frequency of striking at the coulomb barrier that is f and there is a penetration probability so with this is alpha here it is coming to come out of this what is the probability that this particle will penetrate and it is assumed that the alpha particle is already preformed inside so that means inside the nucleus there are clusters of alpha two protons and two neutrons combined inside the nucleus to form a alpha particle so that probability is assumed to be 1 for even even nuclei so it is easily possible now 
how to calculate this one these two factors so the frequency of striking the barrier is you can calculate based on the de broglie wavelength de broglie wavelength h cross upon mu v where mu is the reduced mass g is the velocity so this this is equal to de broglie wavelength is close to the radius of the nucleus so because the the, the the distance that alpha has to travel inside the potential well will be close to the radius of the nucleus so this is the radius of the nucleus heavy nucleus so de broglie wavelength equal to r1 velocity so you, you can see velocity of alpha particle in the nucleus will be you calculate from here x cross upon mu r1 so this is, is now you can find out probably the frequency v equal to n lambda n is the frequency so lambda is given and v is given you can find out the n so n the frequency equal to frequency v equal to n lambda so n equal to v upon lambda so v is the velocity in terms of h cross by mu r lambda is equal to r so it becomes h upon 2 mu r1 square so this is the frequency with which the alpha is striking the barrier and the penetration probability so the barrier penetration from can be obtained from by considering the wave function of alpha inside the nucleus in this region and outside the nucleus by calculating a transmission coefficient that is nothing but the, the transmitted flux upon the incident flux so there is a flux of alpha striking the barrier the flux of alpha going out so there are two three areas there are different wave functions in these three areas you can calculate the transmission coefficient we will not go into details but the product of these two quantities will be the so there is a integration here in fact from r1 to r2 vr potential at a function of r minus the t the kinetic energy to the power half so essentially it is the area under this a, this graph this curve so the curvature the height of the fixed coulomb barrier and the the the, the distance the thickness of this barrier is this determines the lambda so you, this this has been now the integral can be solved and you have the formula h cross upon 2 mu r square the frequency into e raised to minus 8 pi z1 z2 e square by hv cos inverse t by b t is the kinetic energy b is the barrier the power half minus t by b so power half minus into 1 minus t by b 1 by half so this is called the gamma gurney condon formula and it is in fact this formula has been found to be very successful reasonably successful in predicting the half lives or the lambda values of a nuclei you can just see here the decay constant values lambda calculated and the lambda experimental value in second inverse so right from nitrogen 144 to fermium 254 alpha indices are given here which are experimentally known their radii are known and you can see here in terms of the order of magnitude 2.7 minus 24 1 minus 23 1 minus 6 5.8 minus 7 minus 8 8 minus 9 8.4 minus 9, 7.8 minus 19, 1.2 minus 18. So you will find that this, uh, the, the barrier penetration formula of uh, Gamow, Perny and Condon reasonably gives the prediction about the decay constant and therefore the half-lives which are very really close to the experimentally determined half-lives. Okay, so now uh, this is very fine for even even nuclei the the formula just now we derived or that just now we saw the final form of it gives the values close to the experimental values that is possible for the even even nuclei okay see very close to that but so why why it is because the success of it lies because the alpha particle is carrying no angular momentum so l value is zero because alpha particle spin is zero and the two states like you know two, 0 plus to 0 plus of uranium to 32 to thorium to 32 to 28 so 0 to 0 transitions and with alpha having zero spin easily you can explain based on that formula just now we saw 
So S wave alpha particles, there is no problem, there is no hindrance. Once we come to odd A or odd out nuclei, then what was found that the calculated lambda values are much more than the experimental values because there is a hindrance. What is the hindrance? One is the centrifugal barrier. If the alpha particle has to carry certain angular momentum, then there is an additional barrier. Apart from the Coulomb barrier, there is a centrifugal barrier that is L L plus 1 H cross square upon 2 mu R square. It is like a rotational energy of a system. So that hinders the alpha decay. So alpha decay half lives are much longer or lambda values are shorter. So because of this, now for example, here, apart from the ground to ground transition, there are decays to excited states to 2 plus, 4 plus. So the, the probability to populate 2 plus, 4 plus state will be much lower than 0 plus state because now alpha has to carry 2 units of angular momentum, here 4 units of angular momentum and whenever alpha has to carry angular momentum, then there is a centrifugal barrier and therefore even for even even nuclei, the hindrance factor go from up right up to 10 power 4 because of the, the requirement of carrying angular momentum. Whereas for odd A nuclei and odd odd nuclei, even to the ground state, because the now the spins of the heavy nucleus and the, the daughter and parent are different, like here pi by two pi by two minus pi by two plus, and the excited states are also there. So the in in the case of odd mass or odd odd nuclei, not only that the there is a centrifugal barrier, even the pre-formation probability now. The probability that the alpha particle will be formed inside the nucleus will be much less because for alpha to form a, a, a pair may have to break. So there is an unpaired nucleon. So the, because of that, the nucleus is left in an excited state. So invariably you will find that when there is an alpha decay from a odd mass nucleus or odd dot nucleus, population of excited state is more than the ground state. Like Amrisham 241 probability is more to this excited state and which undergoes gamma decay of 60 keV to the ground state of neptunium 237. So what we saw that for the even even nuclei, the penetration formula can reasonably explain the half-lives of the many several nuclei, but for odd mass and odd odd nuclei, there are hindrances due to the preformation of alpha and the centrifugal barrier. Therefore, the predicted half-lives are much longer than the calculated ones. The, the experimental half-lives are much longer than the calculated ones. Now, lastly, we see the systematics of alpha decay because they are very useful to explain. We need to know what is the reason. So, among the isotopes of an element, the same atomic number but varying mass number, the Q value decreases with the increasing mass number. You can see here for a same element like polonium, as the Q, Q, as the mass number is increasing, the, the Q value of the alpha decay or the energy of alpha is decreasing and this trend is seen for all elements. So you can see here also uranium 232 to 238 alpha energy is decreasing. And this can be explained even by the liquid drop mass formula. Later on, we'll see the facility in the fission. You will you'll see also the facility parameter. The same happens with the fission half life. In isobars, same mass number and varying atomic number. Q alpha increases with increasing Z. You can see here to 38 uranium, 38 plutonium isobars. But with increasing Z, the alpha energy is increasing. And now cell effects, the nuclear cell effects influence the half-lives. So if the daughter product, no, alpha, alpha, alpha decay, whatever daughter is formed, having a magic number of protons or neutrons, then because daughter has got a lower half-life. When we say magic number means the nuclei are having more stability, so mass, masses are low. So they are the half-life, the alpha energy is long, high and therefore the half-lives are short. Typical example, polonium 212, Z equal to 84 goes to lead 208. In fact, it's a doubly magic number. So the masses, mass of the lead 208 is much smaller and therefore Q alpha is very high. Correspondingly, the half-life is very short. 
And other aspect is if the parent is having magic number, so the parent mass is low, like one n equal to one twenty six. Though here z equal to eighty two, but the neutron cell effects more dominant here because it is a higher L value. And so uh, you will find that the again the half lives are long because the Q alpha is short. So if the parent is a magic number, then the parent mass is low, and therefore the Q alpha is low, and hence the half life is high. So just see polynomial two ten to polynomial two ten one thirty eight days polynomial two twelve microseconds. So this is the systematics that the cell effects influence the half life of alpha decay, and also the among the isobars and isotopes how the half life change we have just now see. So this is all all, all about alpha decay. I hope I could give you a, a flavor of the alpha decay. Why alpha decay is not seen in the lower mass, seen in the heavy nuclei, all that and the systematics you can explain using the simple concepts. So I'll stop here. In the next talk, next lecture, I will take the beta decay. Thank you very much.